Alright everybody, we're going to talk here about one of the most important topics in medicine and certainly something you're going to need to understand how to work up and that is the acute coronary syndromes which include unstable angina and then MIs which can be STEMI or NSTEMI and they're all a little bit different and you're going to treat them all a little bit differently and you'll need to know kind of the nuances here. This is one of those things you need to know in detail. Um, and that's because it's very common, and if you screw it up, someone's going to die, and someone's going to get sued. So you need to know how to do this. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right-hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely subscribe to my channel, and you'll get notifications every time I put a new video up. All right, so in a previous video, we talked about angina. I'm not going to go into that here. Um, if you don't know what it is, definitely go back and watch that video. It's very important stuff. Um, but just to suffice it to say, angina is chest pain with exertion. It might go away. It might not. You need to know stable versus unstable angina. That is absolutely essential. All right, so this is another way you can visualize it. So let's take a look at how a patient with an acute coronary syndrome may come in. So a 62-year-old guy with a history of hypercholesterolemia, high cholesterol, comes into the ED complaining of substernal pain that he describes as crushing. The episodes are brought on by going up and down the stairs chasing after his dog, i.e. exertion. And this episode has continued despite rest. So this is a guy with, at the very least, unstable angina, but he might be having a heart attack. We do not know. So our next step is going to be an EKG, okay? So three things you always need to do in somebody coming in with chest pain. EKG, cardiac enzymes, chest x-ray. Always, 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 always. Doesn't matter the age, doesn't matter the risk factors. You're always going to order those. They're cheap, they're easy, and you uh, will not miss a heart attack if you uh, get those things. So EKG is really important. You can get it right away, and you can see if the person is having a STEMI, you'll know on EKG. Okay, if they're not, then you know we don't really know what it is necessarily. We've got to wait for the enzymes. So the enzymes will tell us whether they're having a heart attack. Okay, so um, so remember we have unstable angina. Uh, we have NSTEMI, and we have STEMI. And then we get the EKG and the cardiac enzymes. So unstable angina is going to be a normal EKG and normal cardiac enzymes. It's just the pain. NSTEMI is going to be often a normal EKG, but there may be ST depression, but it's not ST elevation, obviously they've got positive cardiac enzymes. If you have positive cardiac enzymes, you're having a heart attack, plain and simple. At that point, you just need to differentiate whether this is NSTEMI or STEMI. And a STEMI, you will see ST elevation and positive cardiac enzymes. All right, initial management, morphine, oxygen, nitrates, and aspirin. All right, now oxygen, uh, we just want to get them above 90. So if they're satting at 93, you do not need to give oxygen uh, because there's some evidence lately that over-oxygenating a patient um, can be associated with negative outcomes. So uh, oxygen only if they're below 90 or if they're in respiratory distress. But morphine, it takes some load off the heart. If they're in pain, their heart's going to be pumping more. Um, so Obviously, if they're in a state of myocardial oxygen deprivation, we do not want the heart to need even more oxygen. Uh, nitroglycerin expands the vessels, increases oxygen delivery. Aspirin, remember aspirin is a COX inhibitor, and that reduces the amount of thromboxane A2, which uh, thromboxane A2 encourages platelet aggregation. Um, clearly, we don't want that to be happening if the patient has um, a uh, blockage. Now, our workup, like I said, EKG, enzymes, chest x-ray, and PTPTT. And uh, EKG will vary depending on what you're dealing with. Um, the enzymes will vary depending on what you're dealing with. Chest x-ray should be absolutely normal. PTPTT should be normal unless they're on anticoagulants. And the reason this is important, by the way, is if they need surgery. Like I've 
told you a million times, uh, your surgeon's going to want those labs done. They will appreciate that. On CCS, you need to know that if you ever have a patient that you think may need surgery, get a PTPTT. And I should add here, uh, type and cross match. Okay, this is cardiac enzymes. Uh, I just want to point out here, CKMV will be abnormal first, but it's not very specific. Um, and then troponin um, will uh, is a little bit more. Um, or, 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 we'll just we'll put the graph here. Okay, so troponin um, is is something that if you're kind of distal from the chest pain and they come in and they've got an elevated troponin, you can probably say, yeah, you had a heart attack. Um, but in the early goings of it, you want to check CKMB because CKMB is going to be the first one that goes up. And also, if you have a patient who uh, had a heart attack and now they're in the hospital and they've developed chest pain, it's troponin that is going to tell you, uh, I'm sorry, it's CKMB that's going to tell you if they're having another heart attack. Because remember that troponin takes a long time to go down. Okay, STEMI and STEMI WTF. <laughs> both cause cardiac enzyme elevation, both are life-threatening emergencies, and both can be anterior, lateral, inferior, which you would determine on EKG. The differences, STEMI is more severe, causes transmural ischemia, and that results in the ST elevation. Because this is a more complete blockage, fibrinolytics may play a role. Now with NSTEMI, this is a blockage that causes a very superficial ischemia. Um, it does cause the pain. It does cause a little bit of necrosis. So it does cause the pos positive cardiac enzymes. Um, but it's you're not going to have ST elevation. And the most important thing to take from this, fibrolytics are, fibrolytics are not useful in these patients. Stenting may be useful, but fibrinolytics are not useful. Okay, now, if you do have to use thrombolytics, there are some contraindications. I doubt this is going to come up, but uh, look for recent surgery and active bleeding. You want to avoid it. Okay, so in NSTEMI, uh, rather than seeing ST elevation, you're likely either going to see nothing or maybe ST depression. You get this kind of this slope upward. So it kind of comes down a little bit further than it should and it kind of slopes upward like that. That is pretty typical for an NSTEMI, but you will not always see it. What you're looking for in an NSTEMI is what you're not seeing. You're not seeing SD elevation. So this is what it looks like on EKG. You really see it here. And uh, let's see where, oh, you can definitely see it here. So it's, it's pretty, comp it's, 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 you can see it in quite a few places. Um, I'm just looking for any others. No, uh, I suppose right here too. Okay, so uh, here's another one. Again, you can see it here and here. Okay. Now this is a STEMI. This is pretty obvious here. So remember, we're talking uh, here about ST elevation. So here's S and here's T. So this is your baseline right here. It's obviously elevated. Okay, where is it? What leads? That's going to be important because they may ask you what kind of infarction is this? What kind of STEMI is this? So our elevations are here. Uh, we see it here. We see it here. And then the lateral leads, not so much. Okay, so uh, what we're looking at here is probably an anterior MI. Okay, how about this one? Here, here here, and that's pretty much it. So 2-3 ABF, what is that? Inferior, inferior wall MI. So you kind of want to know this, and this is step one stuff, but you want to know this, this is useful in the clinic. Um, is our treatment going to change? No, uh, but you want to know, okay? You want to know how to, to determine these. And uh, on step one, a lot of times they'll give you a, an EKG and then they'll say, what artery? Uh, rather than uh, is this inferior or anterior. Um, so um, if you're taking step one, be prepared for that. Step two and three, you just you want to know your leads and understand where the heart attack is. And the reason is because it does give you an idea of the coronary artery. However, all these patients are going to be angiogrammed anyway. 
Okay, now I'm not going to go into reading EKG here, but you should know uh, which leads correspond to which part of the heart. Okay, so management. Um, now this is for unstable angina and NSTEMI. Uh, so uh, a lot of this is going to be the same as STEMI as we'll see. Um, so uh, remember our initial management, morphine, oxygen, nitrates, and aspirin. Um, now we want to do, we, we want to prevent them from clotting. And so we go for antiplatelets and anticoagulants. So our antiplatelets, we do dual antiplatelet therapy. So that means continuing the aspirin and then adding on a P2Y12 inhibitor. What drugs are those? That's clopidogrel, Plavix, very common. Uh, Ticagrelor and Prasagrel. Okay, any of those are fine on your test. Uh, however, uh, Ticagrelor and Prasagrel are a little bit faster acting, a little bit more effective, but they have a higher risk of bleeding. Clopidogrel, uh, a little bit less effective, but less likely to bleed. So um, I would go for Ticagrelor and then put that on top of the aspirin. That's antiplatelet therapy. We also want to do anticoagulation. So in uh, Lovenox, Inoxaparin, or uh, Heparin. It doesn't, on CCS, it's not going to matter, okay? Uh, technically, for um, for unstable angina and NSTEMI, Inoxaparin is better. For STEMI, Heparin is better, and we're talking unfractionated Heparin there. Um, but on step two and three, they're not going to ask that. ACE inhibitor, lisinopril, cardioprotective. Uh, beta blocker, metoprolol. Statin, all patients with unstable angina, acute coronary syndrome get a statin regardless of LDL. Um, our goal is to reduce their uh, LDL by 50%. These patients will be admitted, uh, admitted to the ICU. They'll be put on telemetry. We want to repeat the cardiac enzymes every six hours. Um, they're going to be sent off to angiography, and we want to consult cardiology. Fibrinolytics are of no use in unstable angina or NSTEMI. Fibrinolytics are only for STEMI. Now, for STEMI, we pretty much do the same thing, okay? There's a couple things. For antiplatelet therapy, ticagrelor is good. However, if you're going to be doing fibrinolysis, if you're going to be giving TPA, then clopidogrel is superior. Pretty much everything else, though, is the same. Um, now, reperfusion therapy is what uh, is going to differ here. So for reperfusion therapy, uh, this is we, we do this in STEMI. If the symptom onset is less than 12 hours, then we do either percutaneous intervention, PCI, which involves stenting, or fibrinolysis. How do we decide? All right, well, if you have a facility that can do PCI, go for that. If you do not have a facility that can do PCI and you can get them to one within a period of time that it's not more than two hours since the onset of their symptoms, do that. Usually these patients will have to be uh, helicoptered to another facility. However, if none of that is possible, and again, it's within the last 12 hours, you can do fibrinolysis unless it's contraindicated. So look for something like a recent history of a brain bleed or surgery or something like that. Patients will be admitted to the ICU, continuous cardiac monitoring, repeat cardiac enzymes, consult cardiology. So the, the perfusion therapy and how to figure out which one to do, that is commonly tested. Now, whether we do PCI and just do the stent, or we go on to full-blown cabbage, where we, you know, this is the, the coronary artery grafts, the bypass surgery, um, the Easiest way that the way that I remember it personally for test questions is basically PCI if it's a single vessel disease, cabbage if it's multiple vessels, or you put a stent in and it didn't work. Okay, that's it. So to recap, ACS includes unstable angina, and STEMI, and STEMI, all involve chest pain that doesn't go away with rest. We talked about how to differentiate that. It's based on EKG and enzymes. We always order that in any patient with chest pain. Some pearls for management, Mona. For initial management, morphine, oxygen, nitrates, and aspirin, hold off on the oxygen if saturation is above 90. Patients should get both aspirin and an antiplatelet drug. Remember, dual antiplatelet therapy. Statins should be started on all ACS patients, and we want to get them below 70 um, or uh, 
cut it down by 50%. STEMI, uh, PCI, if you can get there in less than two hours from symptom onset, uh, otherwise thrombolysis, as long as there's no contraindications. But thrombolysis does not play any role in uh, unstable angina or NSTEMI. These patients will always be sent to the ICU and continuous cardiac monitoring or telemetry.